clearly remember the guy putting the gun to my forehead and threatening to kill me if I did anything. At one point, the person with the gun decided that he wanted to go upstairs in my house. My 10-year-old daughter was upstairs taking a shower at the time, and I was pretty sure that that was a gun. So I got up off the ground and I looked him in the eye and I told him to take off his shoes first. And he did. And this was not the response he expected. And shortly thereafter, I realized that the other guys who were there were outside and the door wide open. So I started talking louder and louder and louder. Some people were like, Am I going to struggle? People are walking up and down, walking their dogs and stuff. Somebody might hear. Somebody might go, You know, there's a big car parked outside this house, and there are people loading electronics into it. And someone is screaming inside the house. Maybe 911 would be an appropriate choice. And so I started talking. not down on the ground like I told her, but she's yelling at me. So he takes off, and I chase him out of the house, yelling as loud as I can, because I want to see the license plate of that car. And I see it, and I start yelling the license plate number out, at which point he turns around and fires two shots. try and get me to stop yelling. Hops in the car, takes off. What kind of law enforcement would I be in that situation? Talked about different kinds of long-term memories. You should be able to tell me whether that is an explicit or implicit memory. Once you identify whether it's explicit or implicit, you should be able to tell me which kind of memory it was. And I did testify against him. He ended up getting 14 life sentences. Because less than 24 hours before that, he had shot and murdered somebody in the parking lot. And less than 12 hours before that, he and his friends had broken into a house using the same procedure in January of 2000. And there were a number of other crimes. It ended up being something like 90 felony counts against them.
do. I'm the only witness that's still living. Category of that type of thing. Look at that stuff. And the people are like, It's a great neighborhood. It's a fantastic neighborhood. I wouldn't, I, people are like, why, why do you stay? I'm like, this is a great neighborhood. I've lived here for years and years and years and years. If this one thing happens, you know what? Happens in Buckhead, happens in Cobb County, happens all over. There's nothing, there's nothing about living in Grant Park that makes that more likely to happen. All right, cart. 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 All right, so I've got everybody's cars. No, you have to tell me what you think it was. Okay. Here's one. He gave me some extra detail. That's good too. All right. Here's so one. that was that was an explicit or implicit? Explicit. How do you know it's explicit memory? Because I can tell you about it, right? I can tell you. I'm clearly declaring my knowledge of the event, right? So that's my ex. It's clearly an explicit memory. I know that I know this information. And so if it's an explicit memory, I can choose between an episodic memory or a semantic memory. And for me, what is it? Episodic. It's an episodic memory, right? That's my personal memory from my personal perspective. Now, what is your memory of that event now? Semantic. Semantic, because it's just a fact, right? I just told you a story. You can say, oh, I mean, everybody in here knows that story now. You don't know it from my perspective, but you do know you have a memory. You could go tell somebody else, oh, my teacher today told us a story about how our house got burned. That's a fact. Any of you can learn that information. It's also a matter of public record because I was interviewed on the news, um, I was interviewed in court, so it's a matter of public record. But yeah, that's a semantic memory. Okay. All right. So today we're going to talk about encoding and retrieval for the first part of class, and then we're going to talk about memory and memory errors for the second part of class. And believe it or not, that means that our next exam is. Next week. <laughs> Dang, time goes fast in the summer. All right, so we're going to be focusing on this uh, part of our big diagram of memory today. We'll talk about the encoding process where we get stuff into long term memory and the retrieval process where we take it out. What can you do? It's good stuff to know. What can you do to make these processes more effective? That's what all students want to know, right? Because this is really important for, you know, big sets of stuff. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about a little bit is the biology of memory. We've I've touched on this a bit, but I want to uh, emphasize a few terms. When we form a new long-term memory, when we encode that memory, we are creating what's called a memory of memory traits as a path. Think of it as neurons connected in a sequence. And a memory trace, you know, when that memory trace is activated, you remember the information encoded in that memory. actually see changes in the structural shape and connections between neurons when we form memory traces. The primary mechanism by which these memory traces are formed is a process called long-term potentiation, LT. 
Now you know that when a neuron releases neurotransmitter, it's having an action potential, right? It's releasing. That's the, that's when a neuron fires, right? That's an action potential. So that potential and this potentiation are related. What we're trying to do when we form a memory trace is we're trying to get a particular set of neurons neurons that form that memory trace to stimulate each other in an enhanced way, to treat each other as special. And that way, when one fires, the sequence of firing <coughs> happens really fast, and you have that experience of the information that you store. Now, we can form that memory trace through elaborate rehearsal. But in the beginning, like any pathway, it's weak. I mean, think about it this way. This is the way I visualize the memory trace. I grew up in Colorado, and it snows a lot there. It doesn't snow here. <laughs> it snows a lot in Colorado. And when I was a kid, I had to cross this big field get to my elementary school. And it was always super fun the first day after a snowstorm to be the first kid who got to cross the field because you got to define the path as a kid. Your big old 1970s moon boots got to be the first boots across that field. And that was always fun. And once you were the first person to cross the field, then all the other kids who were coming behind you would put their feet in the same hole so they wouldn't get, right? But some of them would they wouldn't have as big a stride or whatever, so they kind of beat a clearer path. When we came home, we'd go back the same path, same path, same path, same path, right, for several days. And pretty soon, there would be a very clear path leading through that field, and people wouldn't deviate around that path. And then the snow would melt, and we would, you would see that the grass was beaten down to where we had all walked. So even after the snow was gone, the path was clear. And we did that for so many years that there was a very clear path that went kitty corner through this field. So think about that path through the snow, like a memory trace. The first time a kid goes through it, it's pretty scant. But as more kids use the path and go back and forth through the path, encoding and retrieving, encoding and retrieving, encoding and retrieving, that pathway gets defined so that even when the snow disappears, the path is still obvious. Does that make sense? So what we're doing when we consolidate, and that's the process we talked about early on, the very first day or second day, we talked about consolidation. When we take all the information that comes into us through our senses and we consolidate it and consolidate it and consolidate it to make it more concise and more concise until we have the very core of the memory that we think we need to hold on to in order to remember what happened. What we're doing is trying to strengthen that trace so that it will not change. We want the path to stay clear, even once we keep making it. So that there's one clear path through the field. We know exactly where we have to go to get what we want to get to to that memory. Now, there are two kinds of consolidation that we engage in. One is at the synaptic level, that's synaptic consolidation, and one is at the cortical level. We refer to that as systems consolidation. So we're going to talk about two different kinds of structural connective changes that happen as we engage in long-term potentiation, we're trying to reinforce this memory trace so that it will fade in the future. Now, synaptic consolidation happens very quickly. Synaptic, and you, you are all familiar with the structure of a synapse, right? A synapse has, you have, here we have a sending neuron, sending neuron A, Releases neurotransmitters, 
that neurotransmitter is picked up by receptors in neuron B, and this stimulates B, causing B to squeak open. Engage in your elaborate rehearsal activity. For example, as you're thinking about mentally walking across a snowy field, or you're visualizing that that grassy field with the path being down the middle, you either you think about that's like a memory trigger, that's like neurons connecting, that's like a resilience activity. We're actually seeing that. This neuron A is sending out neurotransmitters, more neurotransmitters. And in response, neuron B increases its receptivity of that neurotransmitter. And so now the same firing of neuron A results in an increased stimulation and increased So later on, these two neurons, when they talk to each other, neuron A stimulates neuron B much more than it did the first time. And the more you rehearse, the stronger that connection gets. But that can happen just in a few minutes. I mean, after class, you'll still remember the story about the snowy field. You're already engaging in synaptic consolidation. You are right now physically changing the structure of neurons in your brain. You are changing how a certain subset of those neurons talk to each other. In the order from which that memory is learned. If you think about how many pieces of information you have learned while you were in school, that tells you how much change has happened in your brain since you started school. Lots and lots of times. Every time you think, you facilitate that change. Now, systems consolidation, as I said, has to do with changes in the cortex. And we talked about this earlier. The idea that the hippocampus stimulates different areas of the cortex. I mean, this is the area of the cortex that has the words memory and trace. And this is the area of the cortex that has visual images of snow. And this is the part of the cortex that has images of stuff we know about neurons. And your hippocampus is going to simultaneously stimulate these areas. And over time, these areas will form new connections that did not exist before. You probably never thought of snow and neurons at the same time. But now you will. Because of what you learned in school. And you will associate snow and neurons with the words memory trace. If you've never done that before, either. But with additional consolidation, those neurons in different parts of your cortex will form their own network. They will stimulate each other. And when you hear the word memory trace, you'll think about neurons and the structural changes in neurons and a snowy field and going over it again and again and again to make sure that it doesn't disappear. It makes an easy path to find. That's what makes memory easy to find is that we revisit them and revisit them and revisit them. This is why the memories of your youth are so much easier to recall than memories from, I don't know, what were you doing last year on July 3rd for breakfast? Well, they haven't thought about that at all. But you can remember events from your childhood that you forgot about because they were very vivid. Retrieval of new long-term memories depends on hippocampal activity that 
the recent memory, so as you're studying, for example, for this class, the hippocampus is going to be very active. You're much more likely to see visions of things you talk about in your dreams because your hippocampus is active when you sleep. Things that you've been thinking about during the day. Those are things that are going to pop up in your sleep when your hippocampus is active. But when we talk about we talk about memories you've had for a long time, where we see the most activity is in the cortex. There's some activity in the hippocampus, but those memories that you're bringing up from your childhood, those are cortical memories. The hippocampus doesn't need to be active to really get those. Now, the hippocampus might get involved if you're trying to make new connections with those memories. So maybe you grew up someplace that's snowy, and you remember running across those fields that are snowy and how much fun it was to be the first kid to run across them. Well, if you start making those connections with your own episodic memories, then the hippocampus is going to start to do all these new connections because you're going to have the new <coughs> memory of the concepts you talked about and eventually you're connected with your old memory. You're reintegrating into your old memory. Hippocampus is really active early on in long-term memory formation, but significantly less active later on when you retrieve those long-standing, well-established memories from your early life. <coughs> now, if you want to make that memory trace strong, as I said, you need to go to school down that path, come home on that path. To school on that path, come home on that path. You need to reactivate the trace and reconsolidate the trace. You need to use it. Okay? Use it or lose it. It's true for memories, just like muscles. So you need to reactivate the memory and reconsolidate it. You need lots of opportunities to reactivate and reconsolidate. Reactivate, reconsolidate. So think about the, those terms for a second. You're activating the memory. Basically, you're sending that electrical charge, you're sending that chemical charge down that trace. Go, 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 tell me the information. And then you think about the information, so I'm in working memory, and then you have to send it back to long-term memory. You do consolidation again, maybe adding to your knowledge of that memory. So say you guys go home over the weekend, and you decide you're going to study some stuff from this chapter. So you go and you read the book. And you see what the book says about consolidation and about memory tracing and about synaptic consolidation and systems consolidation. And when you're reading that and you're thinking about what we did in class, and you're reading that stuff in the book, you are reactivating the knowledge that you have from class, and then you're elaborating on it, adding more to it, and reconsolidating it. Every time you do that, you change the memory of those memories. You're adding to those memories. You're maybe adding some stuff to it, taking some stuff away. You're always changing the memory a tiny bit. Now, we like to think we're changing it for the better, and improving it, and polishing it, shining it, making it clean and perfect and neat with all the right information we have. And sometimes that's true. But as we'll see uh, in today's class, it's not always how it works. So as you engage in reactivation and reconsolidation, we can refer to this in general as practice. So you're practicing the information. And there's two strategies that people can use to practice. You can engage in mass practice or distributed practice. Mass practice is pretty similar to cramming. That's where you try to do all of your reactivation and reconsolidation in you know, a very short period of time. That's okay if everybody I know, including me, has crammed for a test. But sometimes that's all you have time to do because you've got stuff, right? There's stuff going on. Sometimes you don't even mean for it to happen that way. It just happens that way. So you're trying to take a whole bunch of reactivation and reconsolidation and do it all in a very short period of time. So maybe you decide you're going to study for eight hours solid before the test. That might be a goal in the daytime. You 
distributed fractional combination here is about dividing up the reactivation of neutral polygons. So that maybe that same eight hours is split up over eight days instead of just being one hour a day. Same amount of time spent reactivating and reconsolidating the bonds. Total. But because you've done it over an extended period of time, you allowed for systems consolidation to happen. Right? Because systems consolidation takes time. Synaptic consolidation happens in minutes. So yes, when you study over the course of one day, you facilitate, you, you're going to get plenty of synaptic consolidation. And that's why when you go back and look at it eight hours later, it's like, oh yeah, I know that. But if you then sleep for an hour or two and then stumble into the test, your hippocampus has had virtually no time whatsoever to do the systematic overall kind of cortical consolidation. You haven't had time to revisit the information when you're rested and think about it again, and ask questions, anything like that. And for this reason, distributed practice is typically more effective for maintaining strong long-term memory. Math practice can give you, you know, okay long-term memory, but how many of you have ever taken a class where you crammed for the test and you got to the final and it was cumulative and you're like, what? Like, I know we talk about this stuff, but I'm just like, oh. And, I mean, just forget, like, two or three semesters later. That stuff's all gone. Because you're like, the whole goal here is to be able to retrieve it on that day at that time when I have to fill in the bubbles. The rest of it, no. Well, it's easier for you to attend effectively for an hour than it is for you to do it for eight hours. That's why when you start studying for a long time, how many times do you find yourself getting up and checking Facebook, getting up and getting a snack, going over, calling your friend, texting what's going on with your friend, Oh, I need to go grocery shopping. My house is never so clean than when I have grit in my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I know that it was true when I was studying, too. I really should study for that test, but first I'm going to clean the kitchen, because wouldn't that be a good thing to do? I'm so guilty. Huh? I said I'm so guilty. Of yeah, that. because no, study for the test. <laughs> but that's hard to do it for eight hours straight, right? Now, for an hour, you might be able to delay the gratification effect for like an hour. <coughs> but it's really hard to do. That's what's going to get added during reconsolidation. Yeah, when you reconsolidate, you're going to add something new. Because you're reactivating the trace as it existed, and then when you reconsolidate it, you're going to make modifications to it. Does that make sense? Consolidation is about modification. You're making changes whenever you consolidate. When you So every time you retrieve a memory, when you bring it back out, you bring it out a little bit different than you put it in, and you put it back a little bit different than it was when you got it out. It's always changing. It's like you might have a shirt that you really love. When it was brand new from the store, it looked one way, and you washed it and washed it and washed it. And it's still technically the same shirt, but it's a little bit worn out compared to how it was in the beginning. Your memories are like that, too. Every time you take them out and wear them, wash them, <laughs> iron them, do whatever to them, they wear out a little bit. And you, keep, you might be able to reinforce that shirt <laughs> somehow, but, you know, things get worn out. The more opportunities you give yourself to encode information in different settings with different cues, the more pathways, basically, you're beating to the same group. So if you give yourself a chance to study it on your own, and then you meet with friends, and you talk about it, you hear about how they think about that content. That's 
class, there could be some other way you can do the class. And then you might talk about it with some other people who weren't even in the class, just, you know, because it was interesting. They want to know what you're studying and all that seems cool. And when you do that, when you try different strategies, maybe you watch a video in cl of the class, or you look at the videos that I've put up um, for people to watch as, as supplements, um, or you read the book, or you, know, you do other things to activate these memory cores. What you're going to do is you're going to develop richer, more elaborate, more resilient representations. And as I've already said, when you sleep on it, your hippocampus gets to kick in and do that systems consolidation, start to do that. And the more opportunities you give your hippocampus to work on building those cortical connections, the more built into your brain that information is going to be. Now, what are some things you can do to encode information effectively? We're going to talk about a variety of different strategies, um, things that will influence how effectively you can retrieve what you want. Because we can encode all kinds of things. But when we encode spontaneously, we may make poor decisions about what to keep and what to put away. So you want to be conscious about things that will facilitate you retrieving what you want to retrieve and not retrieving stuff you just made up. I'm going to go to each one of these on its own slide so that you know which of these spaces in your day you might go through every day. Look, I'll go through them quick so you can look at them. The first thing you want to think about is the level of processing. <coughs> level of processing has to do with how deeply you think about the material you're encountering in your day. So say I want you to remember a word like cat. If I show you a word and I tell you, I want you to indicate if the word I show you is in all capital letters. I'm asking you to think about that material in a visible way. It's a very shallow way. It's very superficial. <coughs> you think about things in a very shallow, superficial way, you don't get very much out of them, and they're very hard to remember. Just think about physical attributes. If you think about what the word sounds like, so if I ask you, if I show you a word on the screen, I say, if the word rhymes with that, then what does that mean? That's a slightly deeper level of processing. That phonological level of processing is a little bit richer because you have to think about it. Okay, Matt, cat, yeah, okay, that rhymes. But if I ask you, does this word reasonably complete the sentence? Sometimes when it's cold, I like to curl up in bed with mom. So if you think about it at that deeper level, does that make sense? If the word was radio, it would be weird to say, sometimes when it's cold, I like to curl up in bed with my cat. Sometimes when it's cold, I like to curl up in bed with my beach. Right? That would make no sense. Right? You can't curl up in bed with the beach. So if you have to think about whether or not the meaning of the word is consistent with the meaning of the sentence. That's deep. And we know that studies have shown in many cases, and it showed for this class, because people did a cog lab on levels of processing, that when you are asked to think about a stimulus in a deeper way, you have significantly better recall of that stimulus later on. So in class, you guys had to look at different stimuli and had to make different judgments about them. Did they have a certain constant vowel sequence? Did they have a certain 
down and put the head put the piece into contact. And very clearly, for the stimuli that you thought about in the training phase at a very superficial level, performance was good. Quite clear. It was somewhat better if you thought about it in a phonological coding way, but it was clearly superior when you had to think about it at semantic level. What does it mean? And so when I encourage you to engage in collaborative rehearsals, part of what I'm asking you to do is find the meaning, find that deep connection that you can make. Because anybody can look at a word and go, oh yeah, I know that word. I, I've seen that word before. We've all taken tests like that, right? Where you look at the multiple choice matrix and you're just looking for the one that, yeah, I think I've seen that word. Have I seen that word? Have I seen that word? And any cognitive scientist worth their soul writing multiple choice tests knows you can do that. Mm. So you know what we're going to do? Since what we really care about is if you really know it, not just whether you can recognize it, those are not the same thing, we're going to put distractors up there that you also recognize. So that it's not just a matter of you're saying, oh, I've seen that before. It's, you're going to say, I've seen all of these before. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to know which one is the right one. So you want to think about, I mean, there's nothing wrong with physical processing. There's nothing wrong with phonological processing, they're good, they serve their own purpose, but if you really want to have good retrieval of concepts, you want to fit them into a semantic context. Think about what they mean, and you will have a better chance of recalling them and being able to speak them. There's also a process called transfer appropriate processing. The basic idea with transfer appropriate processing is that you are going to encode the material in the way that you plan to retrieve it. So the example here is that of study where we had people read a passage. Read a passage that is supposed to learn the information. Everybody read the same passage. One group then was told they were going to have a test on the passage and were encouraged, allowed to reread the passage. The other group was told, you need to generate questions about the passage and test yourself. <laughs> and People who had a chance to reread the passage did better on the stuff that was read. 80% compared to 75% who reviewed the test. So that's after five minutes. After two days, the people who had tested themselves on the questions, on the passage, who tried to come up with questions about the just read it again and think about it while they were reading it, but tried to come up with, think about what kinds of questions could they ask me about the information in the passage? And how would I answer those questions? After two days, their performance had dropped only <coughs> slightly. They were tested on the same passage. But the group that reread their pat their performance was significantly. After one week, the people who had just read and then reread the passage, their performance was down by 40%. Whereas the people who had tested themselves, had tried to generate questions about the material, their performance was by about 55%, so significantly better. So what does this mean? It means if you know you're going to be tested on material, the way to study that material is to test yourself. So practice quizzes are good. If you can find a practice quiz, or if you can make a practice quiz for yourself, that's good because we all know that part of the challenge of taking a test with a new professor 
So we have to learn how that word protects. Right? So they can tell you. But until you actually see those horsemen, and you get a sense for how it works, it's harder for you to imagine. But now everybody has taken a test for this. Can you think about how you might generate questions about the material resource puzzle that might be more like the kind of questions I love to ask? This fights nice things at my professor over and over. You're just like, I don't know. You don't have the same one. But if you when you know I'm gonna ask you multiple choice questions, and you know I'm gonna ask you questions where you have to apply the knowledge, then think about how I could do that. Think about what kind of question could she ask me? And what might the distractors look like? What would be something that I would think is tricky? Hard to tell from outside. Okay. Or you generate some questions, have your friend generate some questions, and test each other as a form of studying. But just reading and rereading the passage from before, I and mean, we've all done this, right? You get the textbook and you grab your highlighter, and you're like, I, uh, pretty soon you're like half, the, like three quarters of the paragraph is highlighted. It doesn't help. Have you ever done this where you read the passage and then you go back and you're like, I know my eyes moved over it, but I have no idea what just happened. <laughs> like I have to go back and do it again and again because I'm like, what? I know my eyes went over. So I'm like reading, rereading, rereading is not going to do you any good because just moving your eyes over the text is not going to help. You want to study the way you will be testing. That's what encoding the way you're going to treat so you know I'm going to ask multiple choice questions, generate multiple choice questions like the kind I ask. And you know I don't ask, here's the definition from the book, this is blank, and then I give you a list of words. I don't ask you questions like that. So don't give yourself multiple choice questions like that, because that's going to give you zero marks. You want to think about real world examples, examples from the videos, examples from class, examples from your life. Those are the things that I'm going to ask you about. transfer from your class to code the way you will be treated. You ever done take an essay test? Study by writing essays. <laughs> it's a different beast, right? That's why you ask if it's going to be an essay test or a multiple choice test, because you study differently depending on what you get. You don't practice for a driving test by playing Mario Kart. driving test by driving. All right, next, encoding specificity. Encoding specificity has to do with putting yourself in the same circumstances. Strong circumstances. So, for example, you're going to take the test in this classroom. How many of you actually feel uncomfortable when you come in the day of the test and you can't sit in the seat you've been sitting in? That's just like, what are you doing in my seat, right? That's my seat. And you see, we see the empty seats in here right now, right? Next week, there's not going to be an empty seat in this room. So make sure you get here early so you get your seat. Because being in this room, hearing me talk about this stuff, you are facilitating retrieval on the day of the test because this is where you take the test. Well, what are some other things you know about the room that are relevant? Well, you know that during the test, it's going to be relatively quiet. So don't study with music. You're like, study with music. It's great. It's like, because in here, there's no music. You're not allowed to have your headphones on. Okay? Now, it's not perfectly silent either. So you don't want to study with noise-canceling headphones on that make it totally silent. But that's not the same either. You need to have kind of a moderate bit of noise 
you know, other people around you noise, like you might have in the library or something like that. And we know from research that if people study with noise and they take a test in a noisy environment, they do better than if they study with noise and then take the test in a quiet environment. A quiet environment is not inherently better for test takers. What matters is, is the environment in which you study similar to the environment in which you were tested? Or is the environment in which you will retrieve similar to the environment in which you encode it? We'll help you. Early on in the semester, I found out that we had a few people in the class who worked at Hartsville Jackson Airport. And one person in the class turned to another person in the class. They both been at Hartsville Jackson. One worked in facilities, the other one worked as a flight attendant. And the person, the flight attendant, couldn't remember how she knew the facilities person. Because this is not the same context. This is a classroom. <coughs> now, if the flight attendant had seen the facilities person near an airport, it would have been a lot easier to say, oh, you're the person who works in the facilities. And the person in the facility is like, oh, you're the flight attendant. But in this context, it, it's confusing because it's not the right environment to see that person. You don't remember retrieving information about them in this place. That's encoding specificity. It's why when you go to a club, I mean, say you are totally sure you are like the only And you don't come to school gothies, but when you party, you goth out. And you go to a goth club and you run into somebody from this class. And they're gothed out too. And you'll be staring at them going, wait, how do I know you? Because this is not right. They'll be like, oh, you're in Dr. Darnell's classroom. And then they'll be like, oh, yes. Wow, you have nice boots. <laughs> because of encoding specificity. You just don't expect to see that person in that environment. And so it's hard to remember. Does that make sense? So this can work all kinds of ways. If you, if you study terms connected to each other, so say you study some terms that are related to each other, it's gonna be harder for you to remember that term, term. So say you study term A and term B right next to each other, or you encounter term A and term B right next to each other. If you only encounter term B with term A, it's going to be really easy for you to get to term B if you see term A. But if you don't see term A, getting to B is going to be hard. So what do you need to do? You need to get to B from A and from C and from D and from E and from F so that lots of different things help you get to B. You want to have encoding specificity that helps you in a lot of ways. If there's different ways you could be asked to get to that. B term. Does that make sense? So sometimes you can take, I mean, by coming to class, you are actually facilitating coding specificity of this material. So go you. That's why coming to class works. At least in part. But you also want to think about what other things you can do to make that testing environment as similar as possible. Because it's not just about your physical environment, it's about the environment of the Well, that's what we're going to talk about. That's the next one. All right. State-dependent learning is not about your external environment. State-dependent learning is about your internal state. You know, abstract question. question. But have you ever had friends that you know that you only know from partying? And when you see them and you start drinking, then you start remembering things about stuff you've done when you were partying with them. But when you're not drinking, you don't think about them because they're the people you drink with, not the people you study with. Well, part of what's making it easier for you to think about them when you drink is that the alcohol is changing your internal state. 
So if you come to class high, if you come to class drunk, please come to the test high or drunk. <laughs> if you study high, if you study drunk, take the test high or drunk. That's what this means. If you come to class sober and you study sober, please take the test sober. <laughs> if you come to class well rested, typically, I mean, don't change your routine a lot the day of the test. If you typically get a good night's sleep, I know you're like, oh, good night's sleep. But if you typically get a good night's sleep, and you're pretty good about getting enough sleep. But the night of the test, the day before the test, you stay up all night, and then you come in here, and you are dragging, because you are tired. It does not matter how many Red Bulls you toss back, how many no-dos you pop, how terrified you are. You have changed your internal state in a way that doesn't facilitate the truth and information. Does that make sense? So the difference between encoding specificity and, and state-dependent learning is encoding specificity is about creating an external environment for you and the information that's consistent so that the primes and the cues all match. So that you teach yourself different primes to get you to the right information. But those all have to do with your external environment. Is it quiet? Is it, you know, this classroom in this configuration? If we're talking about state-dependent learning, we're talking about building a similar internal state. So if you, when you're in school, if every day you have gotten up in the morning, you went for a run, and you had a bagel, had some coffee and you came to class, the day of the test, get up and have a run, have some coffee, have a bagel, and come to class. Keep your internal state the same. And that will help. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's about there's an outside and internal. That's the difference. Other things you can do. Engage in elaboration. So you can come up with, you can tell crazy stories. You can, you don't have to be full stories about your own life. You can create a silly story about different concepts. Or you can come up with, you know, you want to build stories, things that will help you remember. Sometimes that requires tapping into personal memories. Sometimes that's just you make a crazy story because that's what helps you remember. You can associate it with words. So like I said before, you might do something like you're trying to remember notes on a scale. You remember every good boy does fine. To remember every good boy does fine is the order that the notes show up on the scale. You might, you know, you might look, use a special phrase or word or term, <coughs> create a word to help you remember the order of certain processes. Make up a sentence. As my very excellent mother just has just sent us five or just sent us nine pizzas. Is a silly phrase that you knew according to the order of the planet. Is it the first letter of each word of that sentence? Is it the second or first letter of the planet? Is it the sun and opposite of the moon? That's elaboration. Any of those strategies, those mnemonic devices. It can also be based on images. So say you're trying to remember all the things you have to pack. You can imagine, like I, I think about all the things I have to do before I get in the car to go to the airport. Like I have to remember to feed the dog, I have to remember to pack this stuff, and I have to do these other things. And so I imagine my dog sitting there with a toothbrush in his mouth, because I always forget to pack my toothbrush, and I always brush my teeth with my toothbrush. So he's sitting there with my toothbrush in his mouth, and he's got my sneakers, because I have to learn to take my sneakers so that I can walk or run while I'm on my trip, you know, and he's, he's like wearing my sneakers, holding my toothbrush in his mouth, and I imagine this silly image, but it helps me remember all the things that I tend to forget. That's elaboration. You can learn things through organization. So if there are hierarchies, clear schemas, clear structures to the information, flow charts, learn those structures. Those structures will help you. 
then think about, now when you think about long-term memory, you think long-term memory, explicit input, and then you think episodic semantics, and then you think priming, next, procedural, what's next? Conditioning, see you got that, because it's a hierarchy, right? You can see it. How many of you saw the Time Machine and the Encyclopedia? And the Silver Surfer, yeah? And then the weird character with the numbers, and then the rat. Yeah, see? It works, you remember. If there are structures like that that will help you remember, build those for yourself too. Maybe the phone box isn't a good time machine for you. Maybe the time machine for you is looks like something different. Well, imagine that picture then when you think about episodic memory. Think about yourself sitting in a time machine. That might help you remember the episodic memories are your time machines in your life. Make it, you know, you can do that. Self-reference. When you self-reference a concept, you see if you can apply it to yourself. Does this concept describe me? Or does this describe my experience? That's why all throughout this class, I'm always saying, imagine this, imagine that. I'm telling you about my experience, because that's what I know best. But I say, have you ever been to a club? And how many of you are thinking of last time you went to a club? You're like, far too long ago. Or last night, you know? And you talk, you know, by thinking about yourself, by connecting it to yourself, nobody knows you better than you. Nobody thinks about you more than you do. Even if you're not a thinker. Or an exercise. You still think about yourself. So by connecting the concepts to yourself, particularly thinking about whether or not they reflect you or your experience. You, know, you feel that they do reflect you or your experience. That's going to be the most powerful cue to help you remember. We love ourselves. We love we hate ourselves. You also want to practice generation. You want to make yourself come up with terms. Make yourself come up with examples. So, for example, you can study a flashcard. And I can say, all right, I was learning how to write in Japanese. Japanese has a lot of different uh, ways to write. There's a lot of characters. There's a lot of different sequences of characters. And I say I wanted to learn how to write a sound that goes with well, on one side of the card I could put ooh, and on the other side of the card I could put this, and I could go ooh, and then flip it over and go, yep, that's it. Ooh, yep, that's it. That would be very passive, right? So looking at the card and trying to make a visual association of these two things. What's much more powerful is for me to flip open the card and have it say ooh, and then have to write that. Generating, making myself produce the answer before I check. Then do the other way. I show myself this, and then I think that's ooh, and I write it down. And then I flip over the card to see if I'm right. So you want to generate, not just recognize. When you just look at stuff and go, yeah, I know that, yeah, I know that, yeah, I know that, that's passive. And passive learning will give you what we call the illusion of learning. Students come to me all the time and they say, I understand it, but I just can't tell you what I know on the test. And I'm like, I think you don't understand what understand means. What you want to say is, I know when I see it on the test that I've seen it before, but I just don't know what it is that I know about it. Because if you don't know what it is you know about it, what do you know? I'm not sure. So you want to generate. That's why you generate questions. That's why you try to generate, you know, if you're looking through your notes, you know, you might take that 
map, that model of memory. And you might white out all the words, and then you might try to make a list and say, okay, this is one, this is two, this is three, like make put numbers, and then make yourself generate a list of all the labels for that diagram. Or you might look at, say you went back and you looked at this picture, and you covered up the top on all of the slides, and you just looked at that and you said, okay, so that's about being sad, and you're happy, and if you're sad, then you do better on the test if you're sad, and if you're happy when you study, you're sad on the test, and you do better, and if you're happy when you study, then you're do better on the test if you're happy. That's um, state-dependent learning. Let me check and see if I'm right. That's generating. Just looking at the slide and going, state-dependent learning, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad, happy. That's passive. And they both, like, that passive learning facilitates familiarity, because, yeah, you've seen it over and over, but that's very shallow. It's very superficial. You're just looking at it. You're not doing anything with it. And if you sit there and read it out loud, well, okay, so you're making it phonological. That's still only moderate level of encoding. What's going to make you have to work for this knowledge and make it so that you can get it easily when you need it on the test is to be able to look at that situation and say, that sounds like state-dependent learning because you're talking about how you feel and how, the pro how you feel when you study influences how well you do if you feel the same or different when you take the test. You can describe that in your own words. That's it. Then you understand state-dependent learning. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so I go into this place usually just don't ever come to me and say, I, I understand everything, I just can't explain it. Because if you understand it, you can explain it. The fact that you recognize it doesn't mean you get it. It just means So, um, we're going to take our break a little bit early because we need an actual transition, so please go ahead 